Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the August Lunch and Learn from the Warren County Historical Society. Um, I'm John Zimkus, the Education Director and Historian here, and it is my privilege also to be your speaker today. Some of the things coming up at the Historical Society, the Antique Show will be September 9th and 10th at the fairgrounds. Uh, oldest continuous antique show in the state of Ohio. Uh, if you are a member of the society, uh, the admission is free. Uh, if you are not a member, it's $10 with a chance of getting a $2 coupon, which you can pick up at the desk if you go down the ramp before, when you leave here today. Um, it's on uh, Saturday and Sunday. On September 17th and 18th, we have the Frontier Fair, our second Frontier Fair. Uh, we'll have costumed characters, we will have demonstrations, uh, we will have uh, a dancing demonstration here, uh, pioneers and speakers also at the Glendower Mansion, and all this will take place 10 to 4 on the 17th and 18th. Uh, the Lebanon Cemetery Tour will be Thursday, uh, September 29th, $20 at 6 o'clock. Uh, there will be, um, once again, costume characters portraying the people whose graves uh, we will visit. It'll be at 6 o'clock, $20 a person. I will have the pleasure of being your guide to the Lebanon Cemetery. Uh, there will be a uh, ghost walk uh, beginning on September 30th, uh, which is a Saturday, and, or is that a Friday? That is a Friday, and uh, going on to uh, October 1st, and every weekend in October, Fridays will be in downtown uh, Lebanon, and uh, Saturdays will be at uh, the Glendower Mansion, uh, 8 o'clock, $10 of uh, for members, if you're not a member of the society, it's $15. So there's a lot of fun things happening in the next month and a half. Our next speaker for Lunch and Learn will be a former colleague of mine at uh, Barry uh, Junior High School in our days. Um, it is Suzanne Anderson Taylor. Letters from Paris, a teenage pen piles as World War II approaches. Uh, her grandmother, was a high school student in the Mason area, and she had a pen pal uh, in the 1930s when she was 16 with a uh, young boy from France, from Paris. And they wrote back and forth, and after school they continued to write back and forth. And as the 1930s progressed, World War II was coming on the, over the horizon and the letters she received about what he was thinking or what was happening to his home. And fascinating story. I think you'll thoroughly enjoy that one. That'll be Wednesday, September 21st uh, for our Lunch and Learn. October 19th, we will have What Are You Wearing? A History of Fabric. Jeannie Doan, our assistant director and who's also our, our exhibit uh, curator and also our setup manager and about a half a dozen other things, if not more, will be the speaker from our fantastic textile department. The, um, how fabrics changed when new things were found or new ways of growing crops or what have you, or new dyes came into uh, a popularity. So all that will be covered um, in what are you wearing? That'll be in September, I uh, know October, excuse me, October 19th. November 16th, our good friend Fred Compton will be here. He comes every year, always um, getting a great crowd. Thanksgiving, a fabricated holiday. He will talk about how Thanksgiving came about, uh, why for no, actually, historical reason it's in November uh, and many other interesting things for about uh, Thanksgiving. Uh, December 14th, Christmas collectibles from the past, a dime store Christmas. Um, Linda Martin, who is with us today, uh, will be our speaker. Some of you may recall that she shared her fantastic Halloween collection of uh, 1920s through the 1960s. Uh, and now she has uh, 
not quite as an extensive collection, but still a very impressive one concerning uh, Christmas and the decorations from the mid uh, 20th century uh, toward the latter part of that century. So, so we've got some fantastic things coming up. Uh, please remember that uh, your admission here also gives you free access to the museum, which we have some fantastic displays. If you haven't already been visiting through there, it also gives you a discount at the gift shop. So take advantage of that. Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you've enjoyed your lunch today. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce the speaker of the afternoon. And uh, I took a few notes uh, about John, uh, just a few, but no, uh, all kidding aside. I was wandering through my library last night and um, I saw a book on a shelf that was the follow-up book that T.H. White wrote to the once and future king. It's a rare book. As a matter of fact, I had to have a London book finder look for two years because there were so few copies made. But it's called The Book of Merlin. And it describes how when a young King Arthur wanders into Merlin's study, he's amazed at all the things he finds and sees there. Well, I wandered in the other day to the rear of the library in the wee morning hours and turned a light on. And I looked at such a place full of maps and photos and books and files and research. It was John Zimkus's desk. <laughs> and all I could think of was, this is where the history wizard works. And indeed, he has been our history wizard for a number of years, and we're blessed to have him. John is one of those rare people who's a natural scholar, and his drive is never stopping. And I've learned early on as the executive director to be very careful at what I ask John to research, because three hours later, I have three feet of papers and research documents at my desk. As an educator, his students tell the story. They come in the building and they remember. And as a retired educator, and some of us here are, I know that's perhaps the greatest compliment. When a teacher who's had, when a student who's had many teachers over the course of the years remembers your class and the nature of the material you imparted to them. And John has that incredible gift. He shared that gift with the county with the city. He's been acknowledged by all sorts of people as our county historian. And of course, we're very proud that he's with us today. So without further ado, Mr. John Zimkus. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I hate to spoil the mood by talking right now. I should be leaving. <laughs> well, we're going to talk about the passenger pigeon. There's a lot of confusion of the passenger pigeon as to what it was and what it was like. When the first Europeans settled, it was the most abundant bird in all of North America. Probably one of the most plentiful creatures to ever inhabit the Earth. Smithsonian Institute, um, it has the, um, it is estimated that one fourth of all the birds in all of North America prior to European settlers were passenger pigeons. Some people have estimated as many as 40% were passenger pigeons. Yet by the early 20th century, they were gone off the face of the earth. Not a single one left. The passenger pigeon or the wild pigeon has the scientific name of ectopiste migratorius. Ectopiste meaning moving about or wandering migratorious migrating. The name carries the connotation that the birds not only migrated from spring to and fall, but also moved about from season to season, selecting a favorable environment for nesting and feeding. They should not be confused with the carrier pigeon or the homing pigeon. Having the common name passenger pigeon, it does, a, does not help to diffuse the confusion. Uh, the word passenger, however, is actually derived from the French word passager, P-A-S-S-A-G-E-R. 
when written and mispronounced, it looks like passenger, but it really means passing by. Once again, referring to the migratory aspect of the bird. The mourning dove is their closest relative, and although they resemble in shape and color, they are smaller and less bright colored. The range of the passenger pigeon in its migration was from central Ontario and Quebec and Nova Scotia south to the uplands of Texas, Louisiana, Alabama, Georgia, and Florida. The migratory flights were said to be spectacular. Uh, speeds up to 60 miles an hour. Uh, estimated three to five billion birds. B, billion with a B. Uh, when the, North, when the uh, Europeans first came. Uh, the red area is their migratory range. Their principal breeding area is the black, which does include Ohio. That's where they did a lot of their in-between flying for feeding and for nesting. The physical appearance of the bird, uh, flight characteristic of grace and speed and maneuverability, the head and the neck were small, uh, wings were long and pointed, large breast muscles uh, for the capacity of long flights. Uh, length, the average male was about 16 and a half inches, the female an inch or so shorter. The head and upper body of the male were clear bluish gray with black streaks, patches of pink, pink incandescence uh, on the side of the throats and a shining metallic bronze green and purple in the back of the neck. The lower throat and breast were soft rose gradually shading to a white or uh, in the lower abdomen. The female, duller and paler, its head and back were brownish gray. The incandescent patches on the throat and the back uh, were less bright and the breast was a pale cinnamon rose. Early Americans who thought they could be no end to the vast numbers uh, hunted the beautiful slate bird into oblivion, the last one dying in Cincinnati in 1914 at the zoo. At the Smithsonian today, she is a stuffed reminder of what once. The extinction of the passenger pigeon was a poignant, poignant example of what happens when the interest of man clashes with the interest of nature. In the early days of North America, whales inhabited the Hudson River Valley. 16-pound lobsters were found on the offshore. Deer, bear, elk, American bison, the buffalo, were by the hundreds, in the latter case, even millions. But their numbers paled when compared to the passenger pigeon. Again and again, the early explorers in America wrote in their journals of the immense flocks, so great they, that they eclipsed the sun. French explorer Jacques Cartier, uh, 1491 to 1557, was the first European to describe uh, and mapped the Gulf of uh, the St. Lawrence River and the shores of the St. Lawrence River. He was also the first European to record the sighting of the passenger pigeon. Samuel D. Champlain, a, a century later, founder of Quebec in 1608, while mapping the coast of New England in 1605, wrote he saw, quote, countless numbers of pigeons that his party shot in large numbers for provisions. Though Champlain was probably the first European to have his men shoot a passenger pigeon, he was certainly not the last. These pigeons supplied countless other explorers and settlers, made the difference between life and death for early struggling, uh, struggling colonists, and helped the colony of Plymouth Rock fend off famine in the year 1648. Governor John Winthrop, second governor of the Massachusetts Bay Colony, wrote, the pigeons proved a great blessing at being incredible what multitudes of them were killed daily. For the next two centuries, the passenger pigeon uh, was the most important part of the diet of many settlers. Uh, they suffered also from the fact that they were also quite delicious. Uh, they were good to eat, unfortunately, um, sometimes ridiculously easy to capture and also sometimes fun to shoot. In the late 18th and 19th century, pigeon pie, passenger pigeon pie, was a favored meal. 
about a half dozen birds would fill in the pie, uh, quote, which would often carry three pigeon legs in the crust, show the what delights were contained within. In 1978, there was a miniseries on television, which I thoroughly enjoyed, Awakening Land, uh, based on Conrad Richter's three books, the trees, the fields, and the town. It's about pioneer Ohio life. Uh, Sared Luckett, a backwoods woman, uh, played by Elizabeth Montgomery, was a protagonist in the book and the miniseries. In part of the show, she does prepare pigeon pie, the popular dish of the day. Uh, today on the internet, you can find recipes for mock pigeon pie uh, using Cornish hens as a substitute. When the pigeons were abundant, they were often eaten for breakfast, dinner, and supper, until, quote, their very name became sickening. Then they were salted away for winter. Um, for a delicacy, they were pickled. When human appetites were satisfied, the, the birds were fed to the hawks. Sometimes the birds were boiled down till only their fat remained, sweet fats into barrels. The passenger pigeon's feathers were believed to give long life to those who slept on the pillows stuffed with them, uh, said to be as comfortable as goose down. In St. Jerome, Jerome, Quebec, a city of about 80,000 people today, 28 miles northwest of Montreal, uh, in the early days, a young woman was never married until a bed and pillow made of pigeon feathers was part of her dowry. The passenger pigeon was believed to be, have medicinal properties. The blood and dung were considered cure-alls, effective against a variety of disorders, including stomach aches, headaches, migraines, and lethargy. I guess if you're eating some pigeon dung, you're not gonna think of your headache anymore. <laughs> Obviously, the pigeons were valuable to not only Native Americans, but also the early uh, Euro-Americans. Uh, easy to tame, Set settlers killed large numbers of birds during the spring and fall during the migration. They flew in such enormous flocks that it's almost impossible for the modern mind to visualize them. Um, you know, 150 years ago, 200 years ago, you know, millions and billions of birds in the sky at one time. The birds migrated in tight formations that stretched for hundreds of miles. The leading edge of a flock could be crossing the Ohio River near Cincinnati, where the tail end of that same flock was still in the mountains of Tennessee. Uh, like our tornado in the treetops, the sound they made uh, reminded many people of the distant roar of Niagara Falls. Alexandra Wilson, the Scottish-American poet, ornithologist, and illustrator, it was he and not John James Audubon who first attempted to paint and describe all of America's birds. His first experience with the passenger pigeon was when he was visiting a, uh, an acquaintance in a, a frontier settlement. All of a sudden he wrote, there was a loud rushing roar, succeeded by the instant darkness, which in a few moments I took for a tornado about to overcome the house and everything around it in destruction. He reported that the people in the house with him said, it's only the pigeons. John Muir, naturalist and co-founder of the Sierra Club, uh, in his memoir, The Stories of My Boyhood and Youth, wrote, I have seen flocks dreaming south in the falls so large that they were flowing over from the horizon to horizon in an almost continuous stream all day long. <clears throat> At a rate of 40 or 50 miles an hour, like a mighty river in the sky, widening, contracting, descending like falls and cataracts, rising suddenly here and there in huge ragged masses like a high plastic spray. In 1871, a naturalist estimated that in one nesting area in Wisconsin, a measured 850 square miles, 850 square miles, yes, and contained more than 130 million pigeons. So close together were the pigeons that one shot could bring down dozens of birds. A record of one man with a double-barrel shotgun took down 124 pigeons. 
A pole thrown on a low-flying flock could have a heavy toll. Even a well-placed stone could kill a pigeon in dense flocks. They were shot with such ease that in the mid-19th centuries, many did not consider them a game bird because they were too easy to get. John James Audubon, America's most famous ornithologist, witnessed many a flock. In one such flock in Kentucky, he wrote, the air was literally filled with pigeons. The light of the noonday was obscured as if by an eclipse. The dung fell in spots, not unlike melting snow, and the continuous buzz of the wings had a tendency to lull my senses to repose. Traveling to Louisville, he continued to watch the same migrating flock, which flew over in undiminished numbers for three days. The people were in arms, he wrote. The banks of the Ohio River were covered with men and boys incessantly shooting. Multitudes were destroyed. When the pigeons roosted at night, they filled branches of thousands of acres of trees. Audubon once again describes what he saw. The dung lay several inches deep, covering the whole extent of the roosting place like a bed of snow. Many trees, two feet in diameter, I observed were broken off at no great distance from the ground, and the branches of many of the largest and tallest had given way, as if the forest had been swept by a tornado. Everything proved to me that the number of birds resorting in this part of the forest must be immense beyond conception. During the day, the pigeons scoured the countryside for their food. They returned to the roost of the evening. At this time, the men of the surrounding communities were waiting for them. During the hours required for the millions of birds to return, there was an ample opportunity for the hunters to get a new supply of pigeons. Audubon describes the scene. As the period of arrival approached, their foes anxiously paired to receive them. Suddenly there burst forth a general cry, here they come. The noise which they made, though yet distant, reminded me of a gale at sea passing through the riggings of a close reef vessel. The pigeons arriving by thousands alighted everywhere, once above, one above another, until solid masses were large as hogsheads were formed on the branches around. Now, Audubon makes the comment about a hogshead. A hogshead in this case is not the head of a hog. Uh, it is in fact a cast, what we might call a barrel. Uh, it can hold liquid, usually alcohol. It was a unit of measure. Uh, holding about 64 uh, gallons of beer or wine or what have you. Using the term barrel to describe that can be somewhat misleading also, since the barrel was also a measure of, uh, a unit of measure. So we have the, the barrel over here and the hogshead over here. Although you can use barrel as a generic term, in this case, uh, when compared to the hogshead, it is not. Audubon continued, here the perches were, gave way with a crash, falling to the ground, destroying hundreds of birds beneath. It was a scene of uproar and confusion. Toward the approach of day, the noise somewhat, some measure subsided. It was then that the authors of all this devastation began entering among the dead, dying, and mangled. The pigeons were picked up and piled into heaps until each had as many as he could possibly could dispose of when the hogs were let loose to feed on the remainder. The amount of time a, the passenger pigeon spent at a roosting area depended upon the size of that roosting area, the amount of food available, the weather and the freedom of molestation, as they called it. In 1833, it is reported that one flock spent three months on the Little Hocking River in Washington County in Ohio. Alexander Wilson, again, in his study of the Passion Pigeon, calculated that in one uh, flock he observed had two and a quarter million birds. Uh, he thought they ate about a half a pint of mast, M-A-S-T, a collection of nuts, uh, particularly beech nut, to be found on the forest floor amounted to about 17,000 bushels per day for a flock of that size. Audubon observed 
that the passenger pigeon's ferocious appetite in feeding frenzy, when he wrote, whilst feeding, their avidity at times so great that in an attempt to swallow a large acorn or nut, they are seen gasping for a long while as if they were agonizing of suffocation. Uh, we hear in this particular painting, we do see them eating the beech nut and other things, and in some cases choking themselves, trying to get more food down their system. In 1806 in Marietta, a school children were dismissed so they could go down the Ohio River with the rest of the town to see the flocks seeking out gravel and water. From a report of the Genealogical Survey of Ohio, dated 1882, the beauty of such a scene was described. The flocks, after a little circling in the foremost ranks, alighted on the ground, presenting a front of over a quarter of a mile, with a depth as nearly a hundred yards. A very few, in a very few moments, those in the rear, finding the ground nearly stripped of mast, arose over the treetops and alighted in front of the advancing column. This movement soon became continuous and uniform, the birds in the rear flying to the front so rapidly that the whole present presented an appearance of a rolling cylinder. Having the diameter about 50 yards, the, its interior filled with flying leaves and grass, the noise was deafening and the sight confusing to the mind as they constantly flew in front of the other ones to get the food. Because the pigeons concentrated in such huge numbers, they needed large forests to exist. When settlers started clearing out more forests for farmland, this forced the birds to shift somewhat as to uh, where they were going to settle. Uh, they soon turned to other sources, utilizing the grain fields for the farmers and often seriously damaging their crops. When the hordes of birds settled in the grove of maple trees, they often destroyed them, losing the, all the maple syrup that farmer hoped to get from the trees. The dung fell thick and killed the grass and left the land unusable for several years. Farmers who sowed the seed, pigeons often swooped down to help themselves to the wheat seed, so that destroyed what they were going to do. Farmers took to revenge against the passenger pigeons by hunting them. The attitude in early America was that the animals, all of them, birds, fish, what have you, were there for the settlers to use. And they were making good use of the pigeons. No one ever dreamed that one day they all could be gone. It was incomprehensible. As one person once put it, there'll be pigeons as long as the world lasts. The number of pigeons so, were so great that they probably could have withstood the slaughter of the migrating and roosting flocks had it not been for two changes uh, in the sea that sealed their fate. First, men started to kill the pigeons at their breeding grounds. This kept them from raising enough young birds to replace the other pigeons who had been killed during the rest of the year. It, the baby pigeon called the squab didn't die of starvation. They often lost out in other ways. The squabs were even more desirable as food than the adults. They were considered a delicacy, practically all fat, and described as being a light, fine-tasting sort of butter. Um, so the hunters would go through the woods knocking down the flimsy nests with the little birds and having themselves an even greater amount of money for the squab. The second change with a new breed of pigeon hunter, the professional, often called a pigeoneer, huh. um, out to make a quick profit by killing as many birds each year as they could. And as their number increased, those of the passenger pigeon began to dwindle. Ohio pigeoneers were busy in the time of the Civil War. In Circleville, Ohio, in the 1860s, one time, at one time they caught and shipped 225 barrels of pigeons, most of them headed to New York and Boston. As the pigeons were, did everything in flocks, so did they raise their young together. 
The nestings covered thousands of acres of forest, each tree holding as many as 100 nests. And the pigeons would not leave their eggs or young unattended. The professional pigeon pigeoners knew this. This is a photograph of a passenger pigeon squab. This is the most disturbing photograph in my collection. This is a mountain of passenger pigeons. And that mountain of passenger pigeons probably was a, you know, a mere fraction of a percent of passenger pigeons. That would only be, say, for one community. They were in such great numbers. Edo S. Wilson, granddaughter of a Protestant minister and the great granddaughter of an Ottawa chief, was a reporter by trade. In April 1934, in the issue of the AUK, the official publication of the American Ornithological Society, she wrote an article entitled, quote, Personal Recollections of the Passenger Pigeon. It was based on her being an unwilling witness to their slaughter when she was a child. In it, she described the nightmare of the passenger pigeon breeding grounds. Day and night, the horrible business continued. Bird lime covered everything and lay deep in the ground. Pots burning sulfur vomited their lethal fumes here and there, suffocating the birds. Gnomes in the forms of men wearing all tattered clothing, heads covered with burlap, feast encased in old shoes or rubber boots, went about with sticks and clubs knocking off the bird's nest, while others were chopping down trees and breaking off the overladen limbs to gather the squabs. Of the countless thousands of birds bruised, broken, and fallen, comparatively few could be salvaged, yet wagon loads were being driven out in an almost unbroken procession leaving the ground still covered with living, dying, dead, and rotting birds. An inferno where the pigeons had built their Eden. Enormous number of pigeons were sold to city dwellers. The price paid depended upon the law of supply and demand. At one time, a penny could buy as many birds as a person can carry off. Pigeons were caught in such numbers by 1876 that shipment of dead pigeons were unable to recoup the cost of the barrel and the ice. Um, the price of the barrel full of pigeons dropped below 50 cents. Due to an overstocked market, passenger pigeons were instead kept alive so their meat would be fresh when the birds were killed and sold to the markets at an increased value. Thousands of birds were kept in large pins um, through the bad conditions led to many dying from a lack of food and water or by fretting, gnawing at themselves. Many rotted away before they could be sold. There was another reason for the personal pigeons did not always kill the birds. One of them was trap shooting. As the name implies, something is trapped. Initially, it was the passenger pigeons. Live birds were caught for the sports. Millions of birds were slaughtered by trap shooters. Often there were contests to see how many birds could be shot in one day or a fixed period of time by one person. Here we have the netting over here and then uh, where the net would fall on the, uh, the birds. Here we have the result of that net closing. Uh, and you can see that the net is larger than two men, adult men, standing there. Netting was the most common method used by the captured pigeons. The ground was carefully prepared. All feathers were picked up, any blood was removed. Next, the net was laid out in an area baited. Beech nut, the pigeons' favorite food, were used most frequently. A live decoy was often used to attract the birds to the area. The decoy was a pigeon, male mostly at the time because his was more brightly colored, whose eyelids were sewn shut. Placed on a pole or a board or a stool, uh, when the flock heard the stool was removed, the pigeon started flapping its wings as if it was landing, hence the name stool pigeon. 
Okay. Uh, in this particular picture, we have the pole, we have birds up here. The, the, the pole is dropped, the bird would flap, and then they would capture them. This is a roost used to store the live pigeons. Sometimes stuffed birds were also placed in the area when the flock landed, the net was pulled. Originally, the sport birds were placed under a hat or a trap, uh, which they were released. The terminology in some place today still reflects that today. The target is often called a bird. A hit is called a kill. A missed target is a bird away. Uh, the machine uh, which projects the bird is called a trap. Clay targets were starting to be used in replacement of the live birds and they're referred to as clay pigeons. By killing the birds while they were raising the young and by killing the young birds too, the hunter brought about the extinction of the passenger pigeon. The vanishing species when it could no longer reproduce, still the slaughter continued. No one would believe that such an abundant could be nearing extinction. The passenger pigeon needed large numbers to survive and required communal living. In solitary pairs or small colonies, they were not happy and did not thrive. Uh, as they got smaller and smaller in their flocks, they crossed that invisible line separating perpetuation from extinction. Some people, um, without proper knowledge, often said they had gone someplace else this year. Numerous theories were put forth by many of the local hunters. Pigeons drowned at sea. Uh, they washed ashore in Russia. They, they migrated to Chile or Peru to escape persecution. The last wild passenger pigeon was seen around the turn of the century. There is a disagreement as to where it was. One of the last, if not the last, was a passenger pigeon that was near the unincorporated community of Sargents in Scioto Township in Pike County, Ohio, on March 24th, 1900. It was a female. This is where Sargents is today in Pike County. Uh, that is about 82 miles southeast of Lebanon, about 72 miles south of Columbus. The pigeon was spotted by a 14-year-old boy. Press Southworth was his name. He had never seen a bird like that before, so he shot it. Uh, 68 years later, when he was 82 in 1968, he described what, he, uh, what happened. I found the bird perched high in the trees and brought it down without much damage in its appearance. When I took it to the house, mother exclaimed, it's a passenger pigeon. Blanche Barnes, who was the wife of the Park County Sheriff, was a skilled taxidermist. She stuffed and mounted the bird. Not having the correct glass eyes, she used what she had available, black shoe buttons. Because of this, this passenger pigeon is known as buttons. The bird was the last known passenger pigeon in the wild in Ohio. It stayed at the Barnes house from 1900 to 1915. Today it's at the Ohio History Center in Columbus. Looking at, um, I was trying to find out how far away Sargent's was from Lebanon. So I, I Googled it and uh, I got the map and I clicked on the, uh, Google Maps, the actual photograph, less than 100 yards away is of where Sargent's is, is the Portsmouth Gaseous Diffusion Plant. 1,200 acres, federally owned site, one of the three largest gaseous diffusion plants. Uh, they produced enriched uranium for our nation's nuclear weapons program. Uh, after the Cold War, the, 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 the uh, uranium enrichment was suspended. Uh, they've been cleaning the site up since 1989. So I'm not going to take a field trip to where Sargent's is anytime soon. Only a few pigeons still existed in captivity. Concerted efforts were made to find and capture wild pigeons. From 1909 to 1912, the American Ornithologist Union offered $1,500, about $38,000 in what you could spend that money on today, for finding a nesting or colony of passion pigeons. 
there were efforts were very, very futile. By November 1907, the Cincinnati Zoo had the only known surviving passenger pigeons, a female and two males. The female was named Martha, after Martha Washington. They lived in a pagoda-style aviaries in the Cincinnati Zoo built in the 1875. That's a postcard of the aviaries there. One of the males died in April of 1909. Following remaining male died in July of 1910. Martha stood, uh, became a celebrity uh, due to her status of a quote, ending. Several years before her death, she suffered an apoplectic stroke leaving her weakened. So they built a lower roost for her. So she would no longer have to reach the other one. She died at 1 p.m. on September 1st, 1914, of old age. Her body was found lifeless at the bottom of the cage. She was thought to be the, between the age of 17 and 29, although the most accepted age is 29. It was one of the very few times that the exact moment of an extinction of a species has been known. After her death, Martha was quickly brought to the Cincinnati Ice Company, where she was held by her feet and frozen in a 300-pound block of ice. She was then sent by express train to the Smithsonian Institution, arriving on September 4, 1914. Photographed and mounted, uh, she had been molting at the time of her death, and so she was missing some of the feathers, including some of the longest feathers. From 1920s through the 1950s, she was on display in the National Museum uh, Natural History's Bird Hall with the notation, Martha, last of her species, died at 1 p.m. 1 September 1914, age 29, at the Cincinnati Zoological Garden, extinct. She was displayed as part of the Birds of the World exhibit from 1956 to 1999. During their time, she left the Smithsonian twice. In 1966, to be displayed at the Zoological Society of San Diego's Golden Jubilee Conservation Conference in June of 1974. I'm sorry, that was in 66. And in June of 1974, at the Cincinnati Zoo for the dedication of the Passenger Pigeon Memorial. It is the largest pavilion and the last pavilion of that aviaries they had built in 1875. She spent her final years in that particular building. It is now a National Historic Landmark. Martha's main remains is one of the most treasured possessions of the Smithsonian. It is now on public display in Objects of Wonders exhibit. Perhaps the one viable result of the death of Martha and the extinction of the passenger pigeon is that it aroused public interest in the need for stronger conservation laws. Because of these laws, we have saved many other species of our migrating birds and wildlife. Unfortunately, periodically, we keep on forgetting about the importance of preserving the lives and habitats of our fellow creatures on Earth. I will end my talk with what I feel is an astounding prophetic passage written by an American popular novelist about 200 years ago. In 1823, James Fenimore Cooper, this is uh, 91 years before Martha's death, published his book, The Pioneers. It was the first of his five books of the Leatherstocking series. But taken chronologically, it is the fourth book in the main character's life sometimes called the deer slayer, sometimes called the pathfinder, also known as Hawkeye. Uh, if you saw the movie, the, the Last of the Mohicans, Daniel Day-Lewis plays the character. In the movie, they call him Nathaniel. His name in the book is actually Natty Bumpo. They did not want to use that name in the movies, thinking that Natty Bumpo would have too many people laughing, so he's Nathaniel. Uh, in the story, in the Pioneers, Hawkeye is witnessed to the entire town of Templeton, New York, gathering to assault the incoming flock 
of passenger pigeons. So prodigious was the number of birds that the scattering fire of the guns with the hurling of missiles and the cries of the boys had no effect than to break off small flocks from the immense masses that continued to dart along the valley. As if the whole of the feathered tribe were pouring through the one pass. None pretended to collect the game, which lay scattered over the fields in such profusion as to cover the very ground with fluttering victims. Leather stocking, Natty Bumpo, was silent but an easy spectator to all of these proceedings, but was able to keep his sentiments to himself until he saw the introduction of the swivel into the sport. A swivel is a small cannon mounting on a swivel, swiveling stand. So they brought out a little cannon. This comes of settling the country, he said. Here I have known the pigeons to fly for 40 long years, and till you made your clearing, there was no nobody to skeer or to hurt them. I loved to see them come into the woods, for they were a company to a body, hurting nothing being as if it was a harmless as a garter snake. But now it gives me some thoughts when I hear them frightening things whizzing through the air, for I know it's only a motion to bring out all the brats of the village. Well, the Lord won't see the waste of his creatures for nothing, and right will be done to the pigeons as well as others by and by. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, folks, for listening to me. Please uh, visit the museum, and hopefully we will see you uh, next month when we hear about the letters from Paris. <laughs>